Kia ora tato, uh, My name is Claire Wilson. I'm the general manager of NZTE, uh, New Zealand Trade Enterprise, uh, based here in Auckland. And it's my great pleasure to be uh, chairing this session, uh, engaging the public, translating the value of trade. Um, and it's an absolute honour to be here with um, my panel um, members, many of those whom I'm sure you are well aware of and hopefully you've read the bio. But um, in, a, in a nutshell, no, it's automatic, apparently. It's not like the old days, apparently, we used to turn it on because I asked that question. Over here, I've got Richard, Richard Harmon. Many of you will be aware of the writing and work that he's done with the Dominion, uh, TVNZ. He's been in the political issues of the day for, for many years and is um, the proud owner of a website, Politic, uh, which is highly uh, regarded amongst many of us. Then Fran O'Sullivan, certainly the uh, Encyclopedia of International Trade. Uh, she is the um, Editorial Director of NZME and Director of NZ Inc. Um, and also Mood of the Boardroom, which is a really interesting um, uh, piece of a survey that comes out every year with um, our key CEs in, in Aotearoa. And then last but not least, uh, an alumni of NZTE, Joshua Hitchcock. Uh, Joshua is currently the GM operations of Tikotahi Tanga Oti. Oti Atiawa, uh, and uh, he's also on the board of Venture Taranaki, so a really interesting lens uh, from a regional perspective. So um, welcome you all, um, and I'm really looking forward to the korero. We'll have a chat first, and then at the end, um, I'm sure there'll be a myriad of questions from you all uh, for the panel members. So Richard, just, um, just kicking off, um, really keen to understand, um, we all know the value of trade here, probably in this whare, um, but do you think public attitudes have changed over the time that you've been uh, in this field? Yeah, they have. I mean, I probably go back to prehistoric times in many senses. Um, and I began reporting trade just after Britain had joined what was then called the EEC. And um, the New Zealand negotiators were seen as national heroes. Um, and uh, I think at one point Jack Marshall, who was the, the main negotiator, the Minister of Trade, Said, said in a speech in Europe, in the past New Zealanders have come to Europe to fight and to die, today we're here to fight to live. And that pretty much framed the approach that New Zealand took on trade relations with Europe during that period. And I went with Brian Tallboys um, in 1981 when they were doing the sheep meets agreement and Tallboys began that trip by hosting a press conference at Tynecott Cemetery in Ypres where the New Zealanders that had been killed in Passchendaele were buried. And the point was um, pretty obvious. And if you quickly fast forward from there to the Closer Economic Relations Agreement in the 1980s with um, Muldoon, what you see is the beginnings of scepticism about trade. And that came from the manufacturing industries who were worried about losing their protection. And then we go to, of course, to the TPP, and that's where everything changed. And I think um, Vangelis has made the point in other places that the bipartisan um, approach to trade broke down. But what we saw, I think, with TPP was the development of what you might call a coalition of um, the left, particularly the socialist left, um, the growing anti-globalisation movement, which has now morphed into the sort of so-called freedoms movement, and some ethno-nationalists, some, but not all. But what we now face is that between 10, to 10 and 20% of the votes at the last election were cast for parties which are opposed to globalisation and are, are sceptical about its values. Uh, and that's reflected even in a mainstream party like New Zealand First, which has in its manifesto a requirement that no government money be spent on anybody having anything to do with the World Economic Forum. So that's a pretty substantial slice of public opinion that's developed over that period from when the trade negotiators were national heroes to where we are today, and that's the big change. So what do you think's driving that? Oh, God knows. Um, <laughs> I, I think if you look, well, if you look back at, at, say, the lead up to the EEC thing. Farmers were heroes. It was, it was easy to see what a trade agreement could do. It was going to save the bloke down the road who had the farm. It was going to save the local store and the local school. It was tangible. Now, 
it's not nearly as easy to see how, and I was interested in that last panel, how you know, I personally benefit from a trade agreement. How do I benefit from business? And I don't think business is very good, and businesses are not very good at explaining themselves to people. The, the um, move to anti-globalisation is not just happening here in Aotearoa, it's, it's, a, it's happening in a number of other parts of the world. Um, so with that in mind, how do you, what, what could, else could we do? You talk to business, not perhaps telling the story as well as they should. Are there are other pieces of that puzzle. Yeah, well, I think business has got to really up its game in terms of communicating with the public. And, and they, look, on Sunday night on News Hub, there was a story about uh, retail spending being down, which came from some stats, some card stats last week. And there was an interview with someone from the Retailers Association or Federation or whatever they are, who basically said, you know, it was someone else's fault. Someone needed to do something to rescue shops. Well, no. And then the, the same organisation was bleating on about it again on Monday night. And I think that, you know, there's far too much we hear from business a sort of complaint rather than perhaps turning around and saying, wow, you know, it's really competitive in retail shopping before Christmas. You might be able to pick up a bargain. And I think it's just we need to sort of make business a bit sexier. So when going back to when um, the UK uh, joined um, the EU and at, at that point obviously we had to change and pivot in terms of, of what we started, what we were selling um, internationally, I mean we're, we're well known for being innovative, innovative, so as the world pivots, do you think that perhaps we've lost our edge there? Well, the big change that happened when immediately when Britain joined the E, well, in fact, there wasn't much change when it joined the EEC, but the industry that was most affected was dairy. And it took the dairy industry till 2002 to set up Fonterra. So no one was in much of a hurry. It's a nice foray really into, into Fran, who's obviously just um, recently returned um, from San Fran from APEC. Um, Fran, can you give us a bit of, what was the context there? Clearly we didn't have um, our leader, uh, our Prime Minister, in, in attendance. Um, but yeah, what was your sense from those couple of days? Well, I have to say hats off to Van Gelly and also um, Damien O'Connor, who did a sterling job waving the flag for New Zealand. Um, obviously, MFAT, uh, I'm sure, would have scripted the New Zealand statement, but um, Damien, for all, and I'm talking off the record here, for all his bashful presentation and uh, at times quite charming blushing, uh, did a damn good job around the table uh, with um, Xi Jinping and people like Joe Biden. Um, I masqueraded as a member of the media pool. Uh, normally, pool passes go to the New Zealand media contingent, so it would be TVNZ, one of the camera guys, you know, for uh, everybody else. There would be a print reporter, there would be radio, and possibly someone else. Well, none of those people were there. So it was me, a columnist, never would get in the door for this normally. And also the MFAT media advisor. So we were there, we were observing it. And I, I think, you know, from what I understand from very good sources, uh, the, um, you know, the uh, uh, standard Prime Minister did a good job. But however, uh, talking also among officials and other, others, uh, clearly the program that people had sweated over uh, to get uh, Christopher Luxon up there and across a range of meetings didn't take place. The interesting thing to me is without the big guy present, the New Zealand media, frankly, doesn't give a damn when it comes to reporting trade in a big fora. They're not going to go um, off their own accord for what might happen in a global sense, and that's because, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, we are facing the media, um, you know, very crimped uh, budgets, you know, budgets for travel, and also the attention was back here on local events, in other words, forming a coalition. And that's the right sort of judgment call for um, you know, political reporters. But it does, does actually bring into focus the fact that much trade these days is reported by not so much consumer people who might have an eye for how the general public is you know, kind of advantaged or disadvantaged by trade, but from business people who have to persuade 
a news editor that the Ackermans, IPF, all these other things, CPTPP, all the clauses you'll see on the um, MFAT website are worth putting a journalist onto. Uh, when there's contention uh, between parties, it plays up. But again, the political people will do the Bigfoot uh, jobs and they'll do them very well. But the game moves on in between those big events or when you know, people are trailing a Prime Minister offshore to get, um, I guess, you know, the stamp on a, on a European free trade deal or a UK free trade deal, it passes to someone else. And that's part of the problem we have. Uh, we tend to reach out to um, commentators, some of whom are in this room, um, obviously the Steph Honeys and people like that, if you're looking for a technical dissertation on, for instance, what's happening to the digital, um, the DEPA agreement, the DEPA, um, obviously, Natasha here as well, people you know, who, who are experts, Rob Scolle, when you want to get into the detail, and partially that's because they are experts, but the other thing is if you've got limited media time and you're in a busy newsroom, um, you know, often a news editor is going to say, hey, we need you for something else. So that tends to be what happens. Just picking up on CPTPP, because Richard, you, you mentioned that as well, um, when things started to perhaps fall apart with the public um, really engaged. Can talk through, uh, what could have we done differently, all of the various stakeholders uh, in that space, and how do you make that sexy? It's one thing to companies where there's a real immediate benefit over immediately or over time. It's another thing when there's somebody um, that has no real intimate connection with trade, finding that a sexy thing. All right, I'll jump in. <laughs> well, CPTPP, I mean, this was so hilarious. I mean, if you go back, and we both know very well, you know, the views that were taken by Jane Kelsey of this August institution, Labour Party in opposition, sitting down across roads, anti the TPPA, as it was at the time, and then um, Jacinda gets up to APEC um, with a little bit of finessing of that deal by various people, including in this room, um, you know, something else shakes out called CPTPP, and lo and behold, it's embraced. And also, they did a, um, a mechanism to try and get across the, the inclus be more inclusive about trade, get the message out to the public. I think one of the things to me about more recently the upgrade of CPTPP, um, you know, there was such a fundamental shift in business during COVID. And we had so much business, almost like six to eight years, advance on digital trade. In other words, people stayed home. They did, you know, acquired through digital mechanisms. Zoom was invented. A lot of things shifted. And so that required, as much as anything else, the kind of work that Van Gelly and others have done around the deeper to also be brought into um, the CPTPP in whatever form it ends up. Uh, also, the accession protocol. This is a very old agreement now, and it really needs to come up to speed. Uh, some of us would view it as a way of delicately keeping China on the outside and not having to confront some fairly serious issues. But nevertheless, um, it is complex, and it's hard to boil it down. But uh, it's absolutely essential that we are part of this trade gavotte. Richard. Well, if you look back at the protests, God, they seem like eons ago now when you look at them. I mean, here's, here's, a, here's a piece from Stuff, from one of the protesters about a T, in a TPP protest. A dear Hannah said the deal was an attack on the working class. You can't make capitalism nice, she said. It's basically anti-ordinary people having a role in the way the world works. So what the protesters were, were complaining, were doing, was seeing uh, the TPP is a proxy on um, uh, uh, um, globalisation and I think it was made worse by the fact that it was a national government at the time. But it's interesting to reflect that you had these massive pro protests. I mean, there were 10,000 people, including a few people who were to become Labour cabinet ministers, yeah. walking down Queen Street. Mm. When we had that review of the TPP or that TPP mm. ministers meeting a few months ago mm. down in the viaduct, there wasn't a protester to be seen anywhere. Amazing. Yeah. I'll come to Josh in a minute. Just picking up on that, um, uh, obviously, quite turbulent period, um, 
Do you think that was just a moment in time? Um, when, the, when the other FTAs come, come our way, as I know there's been, been talk of India, obviously, uh, and, and the EU when it goes into force uh, in 2024, do you think we will see that same kind of, um, of interest and division? Well, as I said, you know, when the, the TPP ministers met down in the viaduct, there wasn't a single placard of protest outside for the whole weekend. So maybe it was a moment in time, but it was sort of, it was a very, very broad brush that the protesters used, and the submissions to the select committee were, I mean, there were a heap of them, and they were very much in that vein, yeah. So as both um, media gurus, um, what role, and obviously I take your point around that businesses could do more in the space about narrating the value, but what else could media be thinking about to get get the cut through for somebody in, in rural, um, in, in Taranaki, for example, what it means to them, these various FTAs? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Fran's right. And, it, it, you know... We don't have the Australian Financial Review or the Australian yeah. Sydney Morning yeah. Herald here. Um, and uh, back in the day when I was a trade reporter, yeah. Yeah. we also you know, had about newsrooms of up to 20 reporters. Now you've got six. And, uh, and, and of course, everything is, is... I mean, the media is in deep strife. It's under huge threat. And it's just staying alive at the moment. So trade which is not really something that you know people get their rocks off on um doesn't quite compare with a stabbing in mcdonald's in queen street or something like that you know it's just not going to i think that's a dig at the herald (laughs) 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 well spotted (laughs) yeah i I mean there's an element about that (laughs) basically truth uh look it's really hard i think the stories uh that will be of interest is you know, how do you actually penetrate markets? I mean, some of the stories which are really great and uh, hopefully we'll start to see them out of the US as well, but I think Asia NZ over the years has sent, you know, a whole slate of reporters up to Asia, various parts. They come back with a whole pile of stories which talk about doing business, what are the issues? And I think if you're trying to get across uh, to the public, it's that very human face. I mean, I live in the world of the acronyms and, you know, bore the hell out of my readers from time to time. I used to um, have a, going back a few years now, when the Herald had an opinion editor say, O'Sullivan, you can do one trade piece every eight weeks, <laughs> you know. So it was just, you know, rotating with more broad appeal because that's what you have to do to stay in business. But I, I do think um, it was really interesting being in, in San Francisco and seeing that same anti-globalisation um, focus there as well. And, you know, anti the corporatists, you know, it was, it was very similar to what we saw in New Zealand back in the day. Uh, it's still there, it's strong. But the other point I just wanted to make um, is that we talk about trade, but what struck me by being at APEC is how much of it wasn't about just pure trade. A lot of it was about climate, what's happening there, what's happening with AI, what's happening with security. These are the big cross-cutting issues that affect businesses. And so these are the things certainly at a corporate level people are thinking about as well. So just taking it down a level, I guess, and and, and Josh um, Venture-Taranaki on the board and thinking about translating the value of trade, what does that mean, particularly in rural settings, do you think? Mm. Tēnā koe, Claire, tēnā, tēnā la koutou katoa. Um, yeah, it's at, a, at that regional level, it, it becomes a lot harder. Um, and and kind of what, I guess, Claire and Richard have been talking about in terms of the media, you know, they're talking off the back of kind of Auckland-based media. Now, Taranaki Daily News, um, I don't know if anyone reads that regularly, um, you know, have maybe one or two journalists there. Um, trade never really comes up. Um, and it's it's not really a, a topic of conversation in the regions, but it should be. Um, so for us in Taranaki, I'll start with some stats and I'll talk through around kind of what we, where we're seeing some of the, uh, the value um, of, of trade in the region, but also some of the, the impacts of trade for us uh, as communities. So we're a small province, 125,000 people, um, $10 billion GDP, uh, but there are some good numbers within that. Third highest GDP per capita in the country. 
and it's driven off really strong export earners in our dairy, our oil and gas and our manufacturing uh, companies. So while we're 2.5% of the population, we're 7.5% of the export goods out of, out of New Zealand. Um, so as far as these trade agreements that have, been, uh, that have been developed over the years have been really good for a certain part of the population within, within Taranaki, for our dairy farmers, um, for those who work in the oil and gas industry. Um, so there's a mixture there of, of, um, of capital owners, but also uh, a lot of that um, a lot of that export flow does go out of the region as well. So it goes into Fonterra, um, it goes into the overseas oil and gas uh, companies. So for us as a region, we're really starting to think through what does, uh, what does economic development mean to us as a region? Um, and moving away from just the pure economic numbers. Um, because even at an FTA level, and we've heard some of this kind of conversation today, is that we're really in the territory of marginal gains now with all of our new FTAs. So even like you look at the UK FTA, you look at the EU FTA, um, modelling's predicting what a 0.3% uplift to our GDP as a result of those. So a billion dollars might seem like a lot of money, but when you actually put it in that context, it's not. Um, we're talking marginal economic kind of efficiencies here. Uh, so a lot of that value uplift has already, has already happened um, and a lot of the kind of the negative impacts on our, on our environment and we heard a lot of that quoted all from, from the previous uh, group, uh, the previous panel up here. A lot of those kind of effects are actually baked in uh, now. And as we are transitioning our economy, um, we're talking around the board table of Venture Taranaki, we're talking around the various um, iwi organisations that I'm, that I'm a part of as well, around how do we move to that more sustainable future? Uh, how, do we, how do we create an economic model that's not just built on economic returns, but built on, on those social, economic and environmental standards? So seeing those start to come through into these trade agreements, and, and I think with the EU FTA, actually some which finally have some teeth in it, because all of the others were fairly aspirational in terms of their, um, their statements, certainly around, around Māori, around sustainability practices. Um, to see those now start to move into the realm of enforceability, not, maybe not quite full enforceability, but from that perspective, it's starting to, to align with where some of our some of our regional um, economies are starting to are starting to move to, and and some of that is forced. So we are, you know, in, in, in the regions we are, you know, we, we are impacted heavily by government policy. Um, but government policy doesn't really take into account the views of the regions. So in Taranaki, we get a lot of um, you know, a lot of impact coming through in, in the reforms, so the oil and gas exploration ban, um, the change in um, ETS settings for our farming uh, farming industry, all of which are moves that you know personally and I agree with, and a number of our our board and our community actually do agree with. But that that kind of that piece around what this means for Taranaki is that conversation has not been had. Um, certainly not been had at a national level, it's been had at a, at a regional level. And we're seeing, we're seeing the impacts, and we've seen the impacts of trade on our, on our, on our region um, over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Um, we've seen the degradation of our waterways, we've seen the degradation of our, of our reefs, we've seen the influx of, of tourists and the constraints of our you know, the um, impacts they're having on the capacity um, of our region to support those. So these are all really live issues for us at a regional level. Um, and when we talk about kind of engaging the public, um, that engagement's not happening. So I've been, um, as Claire mentioned, I, I was with New Zealand Trade and Enterprise for four years in, in the Auckland and, and Christchurch offices, and so I actually got to work quite a lot with, with Claire on a number of projects over the years. Um, but since moving back to Taranaki in the last two years and moving out of, basically moving out of government and moving into, um, into the private sector and, and into regional economic development, um, you know, MFAT has been absent from our region in that time. You know, I know we've had COVID, um, but you know, there's been uh, two years where I've, I went through and I looked at all the events Venture Taranaki have done, all the events the Cham Taranaki Chamber of Commerce have done, looked at the MFAT website um, to kind of see what engagement activities are happening. Uh, the last thing I could find actually was 2019 when Trade for All um, happened and, and there was those conversations around around the region, um, around, around the country. 
Um, and and we'll, we'll move on to this, this point, I'm, I'm sure, in this, in this panel around kind of the engagement model. Um, but there's, there's certainly things that, that MFAT in particular, but it's a government issue. So it's not just MFAT, it's every, almost every government agency in the way they treat, treat regional New Zealand's. Um, those of us who live outside of Auckland and, and Wellington, and, and to some degree Christchurch as well, um, that, that engagement's not happening, and it's not happening in a way that us, those of us in the regions want it to, to happen. So thinking about engagement then, um, and you talked about sustainability, indigenous, um, is it that, mentioning there could be more engagement, but even if there were, would it resonate with, with, with the public? Yeah, well, and I think maybe it was so your point you were making, Richard, in terms of you know, the lack of protests around, around the, um, the recent ministers' meeting. Um, and you know, a certain level of apathy kind of comes in into the public over time. Um, and it's, it comes down to trust, I think, and trust in institutions, so trust in government, um, which we know kind of has, has, has eroded quite significantly over the last several years. Trust in, in MFAT, trust in politicians, um, and that plays a big part in the receptiveness of communities and how they engage. Um, so for me, engagement, Engagement happens in communities, so it doesn't happen in you know, it doesn't happen in, in your um, in your offices. It doesn't happen out of Auckland or Wellington. Again, kind of coming back to that point, it happens in our communities. Um, and I think of the two main communities that I'm a part of, so the Tiatiawa uh, community, so the local uh, the local iwi in, in New Plymouth, of which I walk a papa to and, and have the pleasure of working for, um, but also the regional economy and a uh, regional um, sector in Taranaki, the uh, the business sector there. And it comes back to that, that kind of comment around, come and talk to us, um, start the conversation. It's, and rebuild that trust, um, that trust with local communities. There's a real sense in Taranaki, and, and, and it, look, our, our mayor gets himself in trouble quite a lot um, by, by frequently getting himself in the media and, and lambasting Wellington and, and having a go at them for, for not engaging and not coming to talk to us and, and will take any opportunity he can get um, to remind government ministers whichever side of the house they sit on, um, you know, that have obligations to come and, and talk to us. And that, that's true across the entire, entire public sector as, as well. But we need to build, rebuild that trust uh, between public sector and regional communities um, and between public sector and iwi. And we had, again, had that panel before and there's things, but it's really easy to erode that trust. So if we look at um, various uh, things that have come out in the last couple of weeks around the use of te reo with an MVAT, but stories like that erode trust. Um, Labour ministers, you know, you know, members of the Labour Party who march against TPP then go into power um, and bring in essentially a, the same agreement with a few changes, that erodes trust. Um, and, and if you don't have that, it's really hard to then pick up the conversation again. It's not to say it's impossible, um, but you've got to be prepared to actually take the time to acknowledge the wrongs that have happened and get back in there and work on restoring that, uh, restoring that relationship. Okay, so coming back to, you talked a little bit about values and obviously values in, 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 your, in Taranaki. Um, and I guess thinking about the value of trade and there's obviously values that overlap. What are the things that really resonate, do you think, when you think of, of your part of the world? Yeah, so values, and we've, we've gone through a real big exercise with this at Venture Taranaki over the last year, and, and a lot of it stems back to the Just Transitions work. So again, there was that conversation around Just Transitions at the previous, um, uh, previous panel, and it's Just Transitions, not just, it's not just a conversation that's happening here in, in New Zealand, but around the world as we move from essentially heavily carbon-based um, economy, uh, which, which Taranaki is, is a big contributor to, um, to a more renewable, to a more sustainable uh, based economy. And as part of a, it's been a long process over four or five years and it's kind of culminated in the last year or so of work that we've, we've done as, a, as, a, as an entity but also in conjunction with our, our iwi leaders and, and with our councils uh, around the region that, you know, for us it's, it's how do we take ownership of, of our economic destiny, our, our regional destiny. Um, and the concept of, you know, as a small region, we know, each, we know everyone. It, it's really easy to get to know a lot of people um, within, within a place like Taranaki, you've, or at least know the families. Um, and so that, that strength of connection is, is really strong. 
Uh, and so the notion that we've kind of, where we've landed is that we're not just about economic growth for the sake of economic growth. We're about ensuring that there's prosperity for all those who live within the region. Um, and so, of course, things like the full well-being um, play a big part in, in terms of our, our, um, our thinking and our assessment of, of, of um, economic initiatives and, and development opportunities. Um, but a big thing we're really kind of ensuring uh, comes to the fore is this notion of geographical and, and, and demographical equity. Um, so we have, you know, we have one main city. We have lots of smaller areas. Uh, you know, we have... Um, we have a lot of concentration of, of manufacturing in, in New Plymouth. We have some very poor areas, um, I think, in terms of Waitara, in terms of Pātia. Uh, those of you who, who may remember some of the history around uh, what the impact of economic reforms and, and what's happened to places like Waitara and Pātia and the loss of their, um, their, their freezing works and the, the big heavy industries that used to uh, work in those towns has kind of devastated rural New Zealand and these small, small towns across the country. And so for us ensuring that whatever we do at that level, at, at a regional level, um, can benefit the entire region um, and that we're making sure that those areas that have been underserved, both by national and regional um, uh, policies, get the benefits of that. Um, so when we put that in a, for us in a, in a trade context, um, you know, it's, things are very heavily geared in this country towards one industry, right? Um, you've got your... Your primary industry uh, gets a lot of a lot of energy. It gets a lot of um, it gets a lot of resourcing. It gets a lot of um, uh, a lot of media attention. Um, and and in, certainly in Tanaki, it's no different. You know, we've got a very large farming industry, but we're really working to how do we transition away from that into into more sustainable um, agricultural practices? How do we take the natural advantages we have as a region and turn those into more higher value products? And then how do we then take those higher value products um, into global markets? So that not only are we either maintaining or increasing the really kind of high standard of living we have uh, in Taranaki, but how are we being that, that change for good? Um, and yeah, and so that's, that's a big part of the focus for us. And then how do you tell that story? Yeah, absolutely. Back to what you were talking about before. Um, Conscious, I'm sure there are a lot of people here that have got lots of questions. I'm going to ask you one last question each. So if you had one thing that should be done to help um, translate the value of trade to, the, to our public, to public here in Aotearoa, what would that be? Just one thing that we could do differently? Come back out and talk to us. Right. Pick up the road shows again. Get on the road. Go to every regional city. Um, come and talk to our business communities. You've got chambers of commerce around the, the country who are organising events every week. They would love to hear from MVAP um, about, what's, about what's happening, um, about what the direction of travel is, um, and start that conversation again and do it at a community level. Uh, don't do it via press release or, or um, requests for... Um, requests for, for feedback on consultation documents on your website, which no one reads um, or has the time to, you know, I only found out about some of these things because I was preparing for this, uh, preparing for this session, um, you know, uh, come out of Wellington, Auckland and come and talk to us. Pran. Yeah, I would say get out the door, to be honest. Um, I think we spend far too much time uh, interrogating where we are here. We've been shut down for four years. We've had a number of trade missions offshore. I have been absolutely stoked to see some of the energy coming out of the Chambers of Commerce and others who aren't waiting for politicians to lead them. They're actually setting up um, missions to go offshore to teach people how to trade, to do business. Um, I'd like to see those people take along a general business reporter with them so that someone tells those stories of opportunities back into here. Because I think if you're going to change the story about what the value of trade actually is, you need to see tangible benefits and you need to capture just actually what it takes to be a business person operating offshore. It's not easy. But, you know, as I said, I've just been absolutely enthused to see over this past six months or so, people finally, including Māori delegations as well, I might add, looking to energise, to get together, to get out there, to use um, you know, just the connections they have, and not wait for government just to get on. But I think, however, 
We, and ultimately, you know, business is done by companies and people. It's not done by government outside of, you know, some fairly large relationships. But ultimately, those stories are not being told here. And I think that is what needs to do. If you want to tell the value of trade, you need to actually show what people are doing. And then you need to show, you know, what open borders do, what it, what it comes down to when you're talking about, you know, some of these different systems that are emerging between... US and China, how are we doing that? How are we learning to work in this new environment? Because it is a new environment, um, and it does take media. So I would encourage those of you who are involved in going offshore to, to get a friendly reporter, young reporter, and take them along with you. Richard. Well, there's not much more to say after both of those <laughs> contributions. I mean, I agree with them both. Um, the, other, the only thing I would say is a negative, in a fact, funny way. I think we've got to get out of the syndrome that there's a silver bullet that will deliver a big bang. You know, we've only just got to get a trade agreement with India and the entire meat industry will be saved overnight. Um, and yes, that was the case in 1972, but it's not the case now. And Fran's absolutely right. Um, the, the fate, get, winning the public opinion battle so that we don't have any more massive protests of Labour MPs down Queen Street on trade agreements means winning every little battle that, you know, so that people understand that if Joe Bloggs business over there works well overseas, that means jobs back here. And I think, you know, those are the stories that we need to be telling at the regional level and at the national level. We need to get back, if you like, to the spirit of 72, where people understood that if there wasn't a trade agreement between New Zealand and the EC, farmers would go out of business, small towns would collapse, and people would lose their jobs. Now, that's a negative way of looking at it, but we need to connect success overseas with prosperity in all the senses of the meaning of that, in all the meanings of that word, back here. Wonderful, what a great way to, to finish before we open the floor. And in, in 1972, there weren't many of us that probably still remember that, but um, the floor is now open. I'm sure there's lots of great questions um, that you have uh, for these panel members. So, um, yes. We've got a, a, a mic coming. Thank you to all the panelists. That was really interesting. I, I can't help wondering, is this really a comms story? Um, talking about the virtues of consultation, engagement, talk to us, get out there. I, I don't want to say that's not the right thing to do, but I'm wondering, do you really think it will help if, in fact, the problems lie elsewhere? And that is because, I, as you were talking, I was thinking... An awful lot of our exports come from regional New Zealand. That is where trade is actually happening. Trade policy happens in Wellington. But the actual export activity is happening in the regions. And if people in the regions are not happy, it's because they're not feeling it. Um, and is the solution really going to come through talking and engagement? Or is there something that actually has to be fixed in a much more material way? Um, and telling good, the good news story might not do the trick. Yeah, well, I guess what's the alternative? So, I, what's the counterfactual to that? If it's not, if it's not a comms issue, then then what is the issue? That would be you have to do something about distributing the benefits of economic activity in Taranaki or in any other regional centre or outlying area, and it, you mean the infrastructure, the education, the local economy. Um, if, if people's living standards are rising, I'm not sure that they would need to be convinced of the value of trade. Well, economic growth was higher um, in the lead up to the TPP than it is now. I guess it's a distributional issue. Yeah, and, and probably the broader point is that, and as we've heard today, like the nature of these trade agreements have changed. So it's no longer just about market access. 
Um, in fact, you almost made a case that it's almost very rarely about market access now. There's multiple chapters in these trade agreements which go well beyond what those kind of original agreements with the, you know, the EEC were, um, which have changed the nature of what we're, what we're talking about. And so it's those flow-on effects which are now changing, essentially changing the deal that rural, rural New Zealand thought they had with trade policy. So it's not about, it's not about market access, it's about the EU sustainability rules, uh, the EU FTA sustainability rules, and, and what does that mean in terms of, say, you know, methane production and the impact on Fonterra and the impact on our farmers. Now that's the conversation we haven't had uh, as a uh, yeah, as a nation, as a as a region, uh, and so it's those it's those new elements to these trade agreements that you know um, very those conversations aren't happening. I think I think in the you know farming corporates, the Fonterra's, Silverfern Farms alliances, and others. I mean they're well abreast of all of that, and they're working very hard with their farming side, but also you know the manufacturing side to meet these new sustainability. Um, uh, thresholds which EU and also their customers are putting on them. If you look at Danone, um, you know, with Fonterra, I mean, and Nestle and others, they are actually saying this is what you need to do if you're going to service us. Um, I think it's really quite tough for uh, companies. Um, not only are they facing that, but then arguably as we move down climate change on top of that at a more kind of granular level, how does that work out with the just transition? What are the issues around that? I mean, these traders, much, much more than what we understand from selling a bag of goods across the border and then pocketing the money or having a bunch of tourists come. I mean, it, it, you know, at that policy level, it's quite difficult. Um, and also that flows down into the corporates themselves. So it is tough, but you've still got to do it. You've still got to get out there and, and overcome, um, you know, these issues because the whole world is going there and unless we want to be a poor little bunch of archipelago in the back end of the Pacific, we actually do need to trade. There's, there's a really interesting process going on at the moment involving Fonterra mm. and the Scope 3 mm. emissions um, project. And Fonterra have taken a while to step into the, the space to provide leadership on um, farm emissions. And they're now starting to do it. And I was at a function in the Waikato a couple of weeks ago where I was turning, talking to an old mate of mine my age who's a dairy farmer, and he was saying, look, there's no point in arguing about it. Um, Font if, if we want to sell milk to Fonterra, this is what we've got to do. And at a National Party conference in Hamilton that I was at, a guy got up and said, look, they, they had a remit calling for a one-stop shop for farm regulation. He said, look, that's all bullshit. Yeah. We've, the people who are going to, to, to lead this debate are Nestle. Yeah. And I think you know, that, that, is the, that that debate is happening every day in every small town in New Zealand just at the moment. Why do we have to change? And the reason we have to change is because our customers want us to change. And if we don't change, we're ultimately going to get hit by um, carbon levies, etc. Yeah. And so I think all of this is in interconnected, and I think it is partly comms, but of course if you're going to get into comms, you've got to have something to communicate. And I think Fonterra has demonstrated at last that it has. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, absolutely outstanding work being done as a PP, uh, P between um, uh, Ministry of Primary Industries, MPI, and also AgriZero, which is your Fonterra, Silverfern Farms and others. And they've invested large into you know, research and what they can do to mitigate emissions in the agri area. But also looking to a number of these companies, how they're penetrating the United States market, for instance, where we don't have an FTA, is by moving, say, with Silverfern Farms to promote um, you know, carbon zero beef, and it's kind of a bit of a thing. But, uh, and then you bang, um, you know, Jacinda Ardern on the show uh, in New York, and she arrives with a chili bin, and that sells a big message to uh, consumers there, which Simon Limmer said resonated well and helped to, you know, put that out there. But it's sort of showing New Zealand also to be not just an advocate in this area, but a practitioner, and I think we just have to do it. And we should embrace it and we should be proud and get on with it. 
Other questions? Yes. Um, I guess the topic of this conversation is engaging the public and translating the value of trade. I guess I wanted to explore the other dimension of that and the other thing which is happening in foreign and trade policy at the moment, which is translating the risks of trade and the extent to which we're seeing across the world and in New Zealand the way in which more conversations are happening about things like friend shoring, um, reducing supply chain, chain risks and reliance on particular partners, and the return of industrial policy, and the way in which we have to kind of balance both of these narratives so that we are giving like a coherent message to the public. Yeah, I mean, that was really obvious actually up at, at, at APEC. Uh, if you look at what I, I attended a um, briefing which Gavin Newsom gave the gov governor of California where he was talking about how the Inflation Reduction Act subsidies had benefited a lot of companies coming into there and from offshore as well to develop uh, green technology and so forth. Uh, friendshoring, a big issue, um, you know, again at that conference, Condi Rice talking about, you know, how, uh, for instance, the US um, government talks about de-risking, but in actual fact, it is decoupling, and particularly in the technology supply chains, uh, where that security risk is predominant. So, I mean, this is a really complex world, and we have to navigate our way through it. So I think, you know, the trade discussion is so much more complex than we both, when we both started reporting all this way back when. And, you know, we had um, Mike all Moore... All was tell <laughs> Yeah, we had Mike Moore heading off around the world with, with um, seven, you know, planes full of journalists and selling T-shirts and whatever. You know, the case for trade was... You know, we would, um, you know, we would lose some industries, but we would get cheap T-shirts for our, our children or something like that. And I'm being a bit banal there, but you know, it was quite quite different. And that world doesn't exist anymore. It's 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 a very different. I mean, I I feel for our trade negotiators having to, you know, pull together a complex agreement on so many levels, which aren't about just taking goods from one place to another. Mm. I think. No. Interesting, um, Fran, you were in the China trip with Hipkins. But I, did you come to Tianjin? No. Uh, Tianjin was a meeting of the World Economic Forum and uh, Christopher Hipkins was on a panel with, amidst others, uh, the Director General of the WTO, whose name I've A forgotten, and even if I remember it, I can't pronounce. Um, and she said that de-risking and decoupling over a you know, the foreseeable future would be the equivalent of taking 7% of world trade out of action, and that that was equivalent to taking Japan out of the, the world trading system. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not an abstract um, idea, and I think one of the, it raises another question, which is that there is a danger, I think, that we're headed into, that we're going to see far too much call on sanctions and political um, strictures on trade, um, because you know e everybody's reluctant to to, uh, to use any other measures. But I mean, we've got s sanctions now. What on Iran, on Russia? Um, presumably, there's going to be something in the Middle East, and it, the list gets longer and longer. And uh, and if you add into that de-risking and decoupling. It, the question is not going to be uh, uh, who don't you trade with, it's going to be can you find anybody to trade with? We, we might we'll be left with Australia. And there's some very live conversations happening um, in a number of regions around kind of those those risks of trade. Um, you know, we've been sold the the economic model for for trade, which was you know. You specialise and, and, and you sell what you're good at and you buy and what, what you're not um, to the extent where you know, when events like uh, these cyclones roll through town, um, when we have these natural disasters, when we find ourselves shut off from the rest of the world and we're reliant on these supply chains that are, are broken um, um, and, and parts of the country where those supply chains are still heavily impacted, um, it has big impacts on those on those regional communities. Um, we have a context of living with a volcano in our backyard and, and two roads out of a region. 
uh, right? So it, you know, it's very easy for, for us to be shut off and shut off for a very long period of time um, if, if um, disaster strikes uh, in, in Taranaki. And so making sure that you still have enough local industry um, that you haven't kind of gone all the way down the road of, of kind of full specialization, um, that you can actually survive and sustain yourself as a, as a community, as a, as a region. These are really live conversations that are happening. And the, the only thing I'd add to that, if I may, I know I'm the chair, but um, with the work that we do with um, customers of the NZT, um, I think of the last 12 months, there's a far greater awareness of the risks involved with various markets than, than there was uh, for sure. Uh, and you know, in Mexico, for example, we've got a team in Mexico City. We're doing more work now, nearly, in Mexico City for companies that are look at friend shoring or you know, CPTPP or the NAFTA advantages of relocating some production, not necessarily out of New Zealand, I may add, from other parts of the world, uh, to get close to their end consumer. So it's a, it's a pretty dynamic, interesting uh, time. Now, conscious of, of that as well, so I've, I'd really like to um, thank our fabulous panel members for the kororo. Um, hopefully they'll stick around for a bit longer, so any further questions, you know where to find them. But um, Richard, Fran, Joshua, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to um, whatever we talk about after this when we have a, a glass of water or something that they're setting up. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.